thank you all for joining us. Because of the way we're structuring this presentation today, um, we ask everyone to please mute your phones um, if you're not a presenter. Uh, you know, I am Kevin Kilbride. I'm with the Fish and Wildlife Service Inventory and Monitoring Program for Refuges. Um, Bridget Flanders, who was going to do the introductions, unfortunately um, is sick today, isn't able to do it, but she might be out there listening and hope she gets better. Um, we are planning for a all refuge biologist meeting coming up during the week of, of November 5th of this year, which we're really excited about. Um, during our meeting, we'll be dedicating an entire day to some very special communica science communications um, training, um, which we're talking about here today. Um, scientists and researchers from different federal agencies um, speak highly of this approach, and we'd like you to hear why straight from that group. Okay. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Randy Olson, um, who is a scientist turned filmmaker. Uh, Randy earned a PhD in biology from Harvard. Um, he then became a ten tenured professor in marine biology at the University of New Hampshire before changing careers and moving to Hollywood to enter film school at the University of Southern California. Randy has written and directed a number of short films and featured documentaries, including, including the 2006 feature documentary, Flock of Dodos, the Evolutionary Intelligent Design um, Circus, and the 2008 mockumentary uh, feature film, Sizzle, a Global Warming Comedy. Uh, Randy has also authored several books, including Don't Be Such a Scientist, talking Substance in the Age of Style, and Houston, We Have a Narrative, Why Science Needs Story. His books explore ways in which scientists can better communicate their work with others, and recently, over the past couple of years, you've developed some pretty incredible um, communications training that follow up on that, which you're going to talk about today. So, Randy, hand it over to you. Okie dokie. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, actually, if you can kind of monitor everybody as we go along, let us know if there's any audio problems. Um, and, yeah, I'll be moderating this hour. Um, that's what we're going to run for is an hour. And um, we've got three guests with us, Michael Bart from National Park Service, Heidi Kuntz from U.S. Geological Survey, and Mike Strauss from U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, each of them will talk for about – I'm going to talk for 10 minutes here in the beginning with background. Then each of them will talk for 10 minutes uh, about their experiences at their agencies. And that should leave us about 15 minutes at the end for uh, discussion Q&A. Um, so let me get started here with the background on what this training program is about. And there's three topics I'm going to talk about here briefly. First off, the mechanics of how story circles narrative training works. Secondly, um, three of the major attributes that it's built upon – and then third, a brief timeline of from the start of it to where we are now. So uh, mechanics of how this training program works, there's two parts to story circles. The initial part is called a demo day, and that usually takes place in a single day. The number of participants ranges from 20 to upwards of 50. The ideal number we've found is about 35, 40 starting to push it, um, 50 we've done a couple times, and that's just kind of too many to hear from everybody. The demo day usually takes place in a single day. The morning session goes from 10 to noon, and I usually run that. That's a lecture and discussion. That's the only lecture in the entire training program of Story Circles. It's the initial session to lay out what the narrative tools are and some of the basic background. Um, lunchtime goes from noon to one usually, and we try and get one or two veterans of story circles, people who have done the training to uh, call in or through Skype and, or be present in the room and give some uh, specifics of what the experience is like. And then the afternoon goes for three hours from one to four. And what we do basically in the afternoon is we take the standard one-hour story circle session and stretch it out to three hours, giving people time to stop and ask questions and explore and probe. And the purpose of the demo day is to make sure that everybody who signs up for Story Circles knows exactly what they're getting into. At the end of the afternoon at 4 o'clock, we pass out sheets and people sign up. And it's not a commitment at that point. It's just an expression of interest. Then the home institution takes all those. And over the next few days or weeks or even months, 
sorts through them and fi- starts to assemble the circles of five individuals who will then meet for the the real training. That's the second part, which is the actual story circle. And that is 10 one-hour sessions that ideally meet once a, a week, um, which would mean it would take two and a half months. But one of the rules is all five people have to be there for a meeting. So if somebody's out of town, then you postpone a week or two weeks or even three weeks. Um, ideally, circles should finish. If you met every week, it'd be two and a half months. Ideally, three to four months. We like to see them go. But we've had some of them that have gone close to a year. And it's amazing. People, once they're in a circle, their mind is in there, and they stay focused on it. And we've done – we'll do our 40th circle in the next couple months, and uh, we've – yet had a circle fall apart, which is really nice. And that's because of this kind of weeding out process that goes through with the demo day to make sure everybody knows what they're getting into. Uh, Second, I want to go through three of the basic attributes of the training that it's built upon. First off, the training is different. It's unlike any other training that you'll find for communications training. Uh, And that's because it comes out of my journey from science to cinema and back to science, as Kevin talked about. In particular, it comes from uh, especially the acting classes that I took my years in Hollywood, uh, Meisner training, and improv training. And that's part of what the the core philosophy is built around is the in improv training, they like to say that improv is like a muscle that you need to condition over time. That's sort of what I adopted to this, which is the idea that narrative is a muscle that you need to condition over time. And the idea that a one-day workshop just really isn't going to do much any more than going to the gym and lifting weights for one day will do much for you. It's really it's about conditioning. So the second attribute is simplicity. That's at the core of the whole training. It's built around this ABT template that we've found is incredibly powerful. I kind of developed it in 2012 and have been promoting it since then, and it's starting to get wide use. And the ABT is the, the ABT framework, everything that goes with it, is at the core of the training. And it's the goal of the whole training, very simply, is one thing, which is what I termed in my book, Houston, We Have a Narrative in 2015, uh, narrative intuition. So this is all about building intuition. That, that makes it very different from university courses. This is not like a semester course. At a university, you would take a course, and the purpose of universities primarily is intellectual development, seeking to expand your mind and learn different things. Um, in this, this is more about your gut. It's about taking just a, a little bit of information and working with it repeatedly week after week to build intuition. And that leads then to the third attribute, which is repetition. We make no apologies that this whole training is built on the idea of repetition. So it's week after week. There is no course syllabus. You're doing the same thing with each session. The, um, each hour-long session, there's a video that runs that's a, a queuing video. And that video guarantees that every session runs exactly 60 minutes, which is nice. So there's never a week where somebody says, oh, we ran over time today. It also moves things along every two to five minutes, keeps queuing things. And one of the consequences of that is that we have never once heard a complaint of somebody's got a domineering personality or something and thrown the whole thing off because there just isn't the chance to dominate it. It keeps moving on. It's so structured like that, which is really nice. Um, the third thing then is to give you a few brief points on the history, the timeline of how this has come about. I sketched out story circles at the end of my book, Houston, We Have a Narrative, and then in 2015, set to work with the first four prototypes. And the prototypes were uh, at three different locations and five people each, um, five undergraduates, five graduate students, five postdocs, and five research scientists. We wanted to see how well this would work. And, And actually, in the beginning, we thought this was going to do better with undergraduates because everybody thinks that they're so attuned to communication and older research scientists might have a hard time with it. What we found in the end was the exact opposite. Um, the undergraduates didn't really connect with it. They didn't get it at a deep level, and they kind of got bored with the repetition. They couldn't quite see the context. As you went up through the different levels, they got more and more realization of what it was about. But when we got to the research scientist uh, prototype at USDA, which Mike Strauss will talk in a bit, um, was the main facilitator there, uh, from the first day, they instantly, they already had a context. They'd already worked on many projects that had suffered from poor narrative structure. And before we could even finish explaining it to them, they were already saying we could apply it for this, this, and this. And that's been our experience, and that's why it's worked so well at the government agencies. We've had a little harder time at universities. We're working on that right now. Universities are much more cerebral and have a tendency to overthink things, and it's just not as easy of a match with them. 
but with the government agencies, it, it seems to work really well. So 2015, we did those prototypes. Then in 2016, we realized this need for the, the two-stage training, so that's when we started the demo day as the screening process to get people that are really firmly committed to do the circles. Um, 2017 and 18, the last two years, then we've locked in the model and have begun scaling it up, and the best experiment in that to date is what went on with National Park Service in Colorado. And starting about a year ago, Larry Perez, their head of communications, did a wonderful job of setting this up for six concurrent circles. And the last of those finished about two months ago or so. And then there's this video, hopefully uh, some of you saw that we did a nice little five-minute video with Larry and a couple of the participants in the circles talking about what the experiment experience was like. And that's where we are now is um, doing our 40th circle and continuing to spread this in different groups and organizations. So that's the whole background, and I haven't said anything about the results. I don't think it's really that much my place to be trying to promote this thing. Uh, it's much better to bring in these three uh, outside voices to tell about their experiences. So that then leads us to – uh, Michael Bart, who was at, at each of these institutions there with a, a circle, there's always one person who agrees to be the facilitator. That's the person who coordinates the logistics and the scheduling, things like that. They're not any sort of instructor. Uh, Michael was one for, I think, a couple circles there. And for each of these three folks that you're going to hear from for about 10 minutes each, I've asked them to talk in particular about the, the 10 sessions. What we've seen now, it's, in some ways, this is almost like a iterated study in which we do the same structure with every group. And so we've got a sample size now, 40 circles that have run. And what comes out of it is a very clear repeating pattern, which is there's basically beginning, middle, and end to the training. The first three sessions are the beginning, and the middle four, um, be the middle, and then the end is the last three. And what you see is recurring patterns of what happens in those beginning sessions versus the middle versus the end. So on that night note, um, Michael, if you could say a couple words of your position there with National Park Service and then take it away for – and I, I may ask you a couple questions, but I'll, I'll keep you on track for about 10 minutes. Sounds good, Randy. So I'm uh, Michael Bart. I'm a geologist with the National Park Service. I work for the Geologic Resources Inventory as a writer and editor. So this sort of uh, communication stuff is, you know, uh, imminently important to my work. And I uh, completed a story circle, I think we wrapped up in December, January. And uh, when Randy asked me to recall my thoughts for this call, uh, and just, you know, describe to put it into the context of the 10 sessions, I realized as I was uh, recalling it that the 10 sessions kind of follow their own narrative arc, which you can put into a, an ABT structure. Say, in the first couple, we were feeling annoyed and frustrated by the whole process. But then, in session four, we had a breakthrough discussion that led us to therefore realize that through repetition, we were building this narrative intuition. Uh, and I think the best example of that is one of the participants in my group was the, the most frustrated in the first couple sessions. Um, and one of the most frustrating things is our ABT scores, they go through and rate different abstracts. Are, you know, are they a 1 to 10 on their narrative strength? And the scores were just all over the place. You know, one person gives it a 1, another person gives it a 10. And we realized that we were just finding the words but or therefore or thus or something like that and not really finding if it fit the narrative structure. So my uh, one participant, Pat Brewer, was the most frustrated. He was like, this is silly. We can find these words. I don't know that these mean that this has stronger narrative structure. Um, by the 10th the session, after we had finished and we celebrated with a pie uh, and kind of, you know, talking and reflecting, it was she that said, we're not really done here, are we? Because, you know, training, like if you put in the sense of exercising, you don't just stop after you've gone to the gym 10 times. And we've actually continued meeting uh, monthly in a very informal session just to talk about um, any examples of narratives in our life or work. We usually kind of end up talking about movies that we've seen, but that works out well. So I'll go back to the uh, the breakthrough that we had, which was when we really started to appreciate the uh, the spirit of the ABT and not just the letter. We had a, uh, an and but therefore statement prepared by one of our participants, Aaron Drake, regarding wilderness areas. So it goes, wilderness is a place of habitat protection and is home to many plants and animals. But many humans don't feel that they belong in the wilderness. Therefore, 
one should visit a wilderness area or mps.gov slash wilderness to explore your connection to wilderness. And this triggered a really interesting discussion on the uh, Facebook group and in our circle because uh, everyone can agree that so the uh, and is an agreement, that's important. Wilderness is a place of habitat protection and is home to many plants and animals. Yes, everyone's nodding. But many humans don't feel that they belong in the wilderness and that immediately kind of triggers, well, wait a minute, I feel like I belong in the wilderness. Uh, so the but is very visceral. It's not just the word, it's actually like, wait a minute, what do you mean? And then the therefore leads you into the uh, you know, the point, which in this case is go visit the website, go explore a wilderness area, learn more about it, essentially. And that got us to appreciate that it's not just the presence of the words and or but or therefore, but it's the, the function of the agreement, the contradiction, and the conclusion uh, that makes uh, the narrative strong. Let me see, I guess uh, to touch on some of the uh, advantages or the experiences from the circle first uh, uh, to echo what Randy said about the facilitator position is entirely uh, not a leader of the circle. In fact, the circles are set up so that there's a variety of roles, story presenter, the timekeeper, etc., and uh, those rotate each time so no one person is in a leadership position. And my role as facilitator was entirely the hurting cats aspect of making sure that everyone had an hour free in their schedule as often as possible, which really led to the autonomous feeling of the story circle. We were all kind of learning at the same time. There was no single person teaching or instructing or saying this is right, this is wrong, which in the first couple groups, uh, first couple sessions, reading through the abstracts and writing them, we definitely found ourselves feeling well, it'd be great if Randy had provided an answer key or some sort of, uh, you know, are we doing this right? By the end of it, we were glad that there wasn't one because it actually forced us to learn the, the process on our own and learn the uh, narrative elements that we were looking for on our own, which I'm sure you all agree if you learn something on your own versus being told that you actually learn it a lot more uh, effectively. So I think that's uh, one of the huge advantages of the group is that you kind of learn as you go along. There's no one person telling you what to do, how to do it. Uh, you have the video, which is um, another source of frustration in the beginning because it has a, you know, there's a tone that goes when the time allotted to a certain section of the session is over. And at that point, you really should just cut off in mid-word and move on to the next thing because it's not fair to go over. Uh, you might be able to imagine that telling a room full of scientists that they have to cut their thoughts short at, at a tone and not when they finish saying what they think they need to say is a little frustrating to some, but by the end of it, uh, we could actually even run it with the sound off or very low and just the change of the color on the video screen, people would cut off their thought, move on to the next, uh, the next uh, part of the session. I guess those are my, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, good. Um, can you tell us about any um, breakthrough moments or days? Anybody coming in talking about they'd applied ABT stuff to what they do? Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, sort of selfishly, one of my, my own experiences was I had the opportunity to go to my undergraduate and talk to their geology class about what I was doing and how I had moved from school into the workforce. And so a big part of it was me describing my time at the school and then since then. And I used, you know, letter for letter, the hero's journey uh, template to describe how I was a flawed individual who wanted to study English but then had my world upended when I took a geology class and discovered that science was very interesting. You know, carry on to the present, I learned the lesson that I could combine my interest in writing to be a writer-editor for a scientific organization. And I... Uh, you know, I mean, it's personally a good feeling to look out and see that my professors in the crowd, like, nodding, appreciating the presentation, and also the, the class, which was everything from freshmen who were taking their requisite science class to, uh, you know, seniors who had done research and were wrapping up. Everyone was interested, and I, I don't know, enthralled might be a strong word, but uh, I had good questions afterwards, and I... Definitely, like, I got partway through preparing my talk, and I was like, what am I doing here? I have a means to use, to, you know, make a presentation interesting. Uh, and so that was 
sort of the, the breakthrough moment for me where it's just like it went from being in the one hour session uh, once every week or two weeks to actually something that I was applying to my to my science communication. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, in that that video that we did with the, the three folks, there, there's a great a number of great quotes in there, one of which uh, at the very beginning, Jenny Powers said, I originally thought this was going to be learn how to write workshop and was glad to see it wasn't. Um, is that sort of what you feel as well? You got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And that's um, sort of what I was getting at saying that there's not a there's not a leader of the group. You know, no one's sitting there telling you this is how you should write. This is what you should do. They're just saying here are some tools that you can use that are very effective um, and, you know, sort of building, as you say, the narrative intuition. And so it just sort of comes naturally when you're thinking about how do I communicate this instead of falling into an and, and, and um, presentation to just be a little bit, uh, at first, to be conscious of it, and then hopefully it'll become an unconscious move to use that, uh, the ABT. Um, you had mentioned that once you guys finished, in January, you've continued to, to meet, or you told me that separately. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So we've, um, as I said, our you know, the participant who was uh, the most sort of reluctant or unconvinced about the value of it, by the end of it, she had suggested that, well, if we've made any progress, we can't stop just because we've completed 10 sessions. So we've, we've been meeting uh, once a month. Uh, for about 45 minutes, usually in the morning over coffee, and we'll, I've, I've opened it up for anyone who is, if they're working on an abstract, they're working on a presentation, to bring it and sort of workshop it uh, in a group of people who are familiar with the, the ABT and the, you know, can use the vocabulary to talk about it. We've also sometimes, you know, just uh, talked about a movie that we've all seen or something and how perhaps as you're watching or else and like, that's the moment where the character's world is upended or, you know, this is the conflict or there's, or if it's, you know, more of an art house film, like how it was lacking and how that was different. Uh, so just sort of staying aware of it as, as our group, as, you know, folks who are familiar with using the vocabulary and uh, looking for a narrative in our work and in the world around us. That's that's really wonderful, and that is kind of the dream vision I laid out in the book was the, the other term I had was narrative culture, the idea of institutions in which we'd start to create these little pockets where everybody could speak this language of the ABT framework, and um, and you see that difference. And, in fact, I heard the same thing, I think, from the USGS circle that it ran as well, uh, which then leads us to Heidi. And um, now for the next 10 minutes, Heidi, how about if you do the same thing, give us a couple words of introduction and take it away and, and also run through those beginning, middle, and end elements of your circle. So Okay, will do. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yes. hold on. This is Kevin Kilbride. Please make sure you mute your phones if you're not a presenter. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone, um, and thanks to Randy for the invitation. My name is Heidi Kuhn. And I'm a USGS public affairs specialist. I've been with the USGS for 25 years and doing communications for 22 years of those, those last. Um, my job then is to translate science. So media wants to pick it up, and so scientists aren't mad with the end product. Um, and then so the general public can understand and appreciate what we do and keep funding us. Um, so demo day, I was invited to participate, and I thought, cool, I'd love to get some tips from a former scientist turned filmmaker, um, and so I can, like, get him to back me up on what I'm trying to get my scientists to do. So I thought, cool. So, and I was invited to participate. It was, like, he was preaching to the choir. It was great. So then <laughs> the invitation came for me to participate in a story circle that someone dropped out of, and I thought, well, I don't know if I have time to do this, um, but why do I, a professional communicator, need this? I mean, I have a BS in journalism. I know how to write, and I think I know how to write, um, and I think I know how to communicate and translate, so whatever. I'll go ahead and do it because it was a, a very kind invitation and I thought, well, you know, I can always brush up on myself. And oh, how right I was. Um, <laughs> Story Circles has actually just helped me find more time in doing my job and to better translate these science stories that are coming out of my agency. So 
I'm going to borrow from Randy's gym analogy um, for the um, sessions one through ten. So sessions one through three, it was like the first day back to running um, on the road. So I hated it. You know, after you're <laughs> you're not practiced for a number of of months or weeks or whatever running, it's always hard getting back into it. Um, these people that I was working with um, in the circle, they were all from varied scientific um, genres, and that was great because I thought, well, cool, they can, you know, I can kind of talk to them and their language, and then we can better understand each other. Well, that's not how it went. It was, we were fighting. I mean, I think some of us were cursing at each other after the first section, but um, ultimately, you know, we got through it. And then sections four through six, we kind of finally hit our stride. We got over some of our pride issues. Um, I got over mine because, you know, of course, I was the writer, and so how was a scientist going to tell me how to write and um, rate my <laughs> abstract? Um, and then finally, um, we were on such a roll we didn't want to stop, and thus we're on a virtual narrative marathon together. And we each contact each other um, here and there, we don't have a formal setup, as Mike does, but we do get together and collaborate on different our journal articles that are coming through. I even contact them about some news releases that might be coming through. Um, so it's been a very worthwhile practice, um, and it's been something that, that I strongly encourage um, scientists who are seeking news attention to employ when they're, they're trying to talk about their product. And, and you had said that um, the other four members of the circle were all scientists, right? Correct. And I think you'd mentioned that has sort of turned into a resource for you now that you speak a common language with these scientists when it comes to communication. Absolutely, yeah. And so I have a cadre of communicators that I regularly work with, but these scientists have also become my go-tos um, because the communicators, while they they know of ABT, they don't. They haven't all practiced it and haven't done the story circles, and so it's not as effective. I don't think um, when we're trying to to roll through something. I mean, they get it. It's a very simple style. That said, it's really hard to employ until you have done that workout, until you have ran that mile, and then you know trained for a 5K or a 10K. It it takes time and practice. And do you remember any sessions, uh, any individuals starting to have breakthroughs or starting to get any, any transitions like that? Yeah, I remember there was a time where there was a scientist who was putting together a journal article to submit, and um, it had been denied a couple of times, and she sent it back through to us, and it was very clear that it was just and, 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 and then all of a sudden her conclusion or her big aha moment was buried in the middle, and she hadn't been able to see it until she was actually reading it to us, and she said, oh, my God, I had no idea. Like, I put the the meat at the very bottom, and it needs to be, you know, closer to the top. And, like, she came to the moment um, of realization herself. It wasn't us, like, having to tell her and lambaste her. It was, it was a, a self-realizing moment. And I can't remember the exact topic. I think it had to do with um, ecosystems and um, – some kind of furry mammal, um, <laughs> but cute furry mammal, but it was it was something about their habitat and how it was impacted by human development and X, Y, and Z. But, the I mean, the real meat was at the bottom, and she didn't um, – she made that aha moment on her own, which was great. That That's great. Um, and, and, you know, communication comes down to two key elements, the, the content of what you're communicating and then the form of how you put it together. And – I fear that for a lot of scientists, they're so fixated on the content, wanting to get every little detail exactly right and feeling the need to get everything in there, that they give short shrift to form or they just fundamentally don't understand it. Have you seen a little bit of a shift, um, especially with those four scientists, that they've begun to realize there's more to communication than just getting everything exactly right, that this form stuff really is a large challenge? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, and I think that they've had more success in getting their articles accepted. Um, they don't need to be as detailed. Um, they really just n need to hit those key points, um, tell the story, the and button, the therefore. 
This is what it is, but this is why this is happening. Therefore, this is what we need to do. And so that really, it really helps spread the scientific word farther and wider, especially now when science is not such a hot media topic. Great. Um, okay, and let's see, before we move on to Mike, uh, you got any last comments, or we'll we'll come back to you in the Q&A? Um, you can just come back to me in the Q&A. It's just it's great. It was a very worthwhile endeavor, and I highly encourage you guys to pursue it. Okay, wonderful. Uh, and now, Mike Strauss, I'll give you a few extra minutes because you've played a major role. Mike's been sort of a co-developer of this whole uh, program uh, along the line. And actually, one of the bizarre things is that he is the world's expert on how story circles actually run, because uh, the truth is, I've never been involved in a circle. I've never really checked in on all the sessions. He's organized around 15 circles at USDA. He, for 12 years, was the director of the Office of Science Quality Review at USDA, uh, retired in January this year, but four years ago, um, tracked me down for a, a talk at one of their society meetings and then became a fundamental part of all this. So he's the guy more than anybody else who's really seen how these uh, circles work. So on that note, um, Mike, why don't you take it from there and say a few more words of background about your involvement. Well, uh, thank you. And I, I think uh, uh, both both Michael and Heidi have touched on a lot of the basics of this. I want to review a couple of things real quickly and tell you a, a couple of short stories of things that, that we saw. Uh, in terms of breaking down from the beginning, the middle, and the end, I would say that, that in the beginning is finding your way. Uh, and, and Heidi's correct that, that, that there is, and, and, and Michael is too, that there is a, a lot of annoyance. Uh, when I ran the first, uh, the prototype circle, circle with USDA people, uh, I remember, I think it was the second session, um, they, uh, the group got pretty angry, and they uh, sort of looked at me sitting in the back of the room and said, why isn't Randy here? Why won't he answer our questions? We and they and they they actually uh, we were taping their entire session because it was a prototype we wanted to see. And when they realized Randy was was going to possibly see it, they started accusing him of leaving them alone, and they were pretty angry about it. Um, and it was a little frustrating. Um, I sent Randy a text, unbeknownst to them, in the back of the room, and said, "They're getting lost. Can I help them?" And to my great surprise, the answer I got back was, "Absolutely not." let them go. And uh, I didn't say anything. By the third to fourth week, people suddenly started to feel more comfortable with the material. They started getting it. Uh, that's led to us assuring people that they will be frustrated, but to keep pushing through it. it then it's in that frustration that you really start learning. Uh, weeks five to seven, I would say, is building skills. Now that you're uh, uh, now that you, you've got the basics. And in 8 to 10, we, we start pushing you to apply it a little more. Uh, to tell you a little bit about what happened in that first session, because it's a good um, uh, example of what happens in a lot of, of other sessions, of the four people, uh, two of them had to organize a, after that session was over, had to organize a uh, presentation on a, a research program on plant disease that covered about 50 to 60 multi-million dollar projects. And uh, they typically uh, produce a 100 to 150 page report. They take it out to outside reviewers who spend two days talking about it and ultimately de go through it in, in pieces. The two that attended our uh, story circle went back and said, we wanna try something different. We wanna use narrative and we want to present this as a series of PowerPoint talks, brief PowerPoint talks. And they worked over it uh, for several weeks, presented it to the outside committee, and then said, now we'll write up uh, our 100-page report. And the committee looked at them and said, don't bother. We already know everything that you're doing. This is wonderful. Uh, and it, it, it shortened their work and made, made it much more impactful. Uh, one of the others uh, has a, a lab where she does a lot of, of uh, presentations to outside groups and had a number of, of videos that were guaranteed to put people to sleep, but you could watch them through it. Uh, I went over about three months after 
she finished story circles and all of her videos had been redone into tight ABT structure and, and people sat there that we took, uh, took over, sat there and listened through them and really came away from that lab with a better understanding of what they were doing <coughs> than any of the, of the other labs they visited. And I think that the top from my point was uh, one, of our, one of the other people who went back to her research group and said, I have a new way of writing our project. Their project was seven full-time scientists. It covered everything from um, uh, chemical relations and water relations to remote sensing all on the Chesapeake Bay. Very complex project. I look back historically over the previous 10 years, and every time those projects came up for review, they, they failed review initially and had to do a lot of work to, to rebuild it. Uh, she came into her group and said, we're using this narrative structure to write our project. Uh, they worked for hours and hours discussing, developing the narrative, and then translating it into about a 70-page project plan that was narrative throughout. Uh, and they got a perfect score. Uh, it was probably one of the best projects that, that we've ever seen go through review, uh, and largely because this huge, complex project was reduced in complexity through the, the narrative structure. So it didn't lose anything in the detail, but it, it, it came out in a very logical and organized way. And then, Mike, can you yeah. jump back in time now a little bit before you and I met the study that you had done there that really kind of mapped out already what the problem was that it turned out I was kind of the solution coming along with, with this stuff? Yeah, what we, we had done a study um, several years before and asked, uh, when I came into the, the agency, uh, about 70, 73, 74% of our projects were making it through review with little difficulty, but there was... 25 to 28% that were having significant difficulty. And the more we tracked them, the more we realized the number was going down, that, or that the, the number that was doing uh, poorly was, was going up, the number that were doing well was going down. Um, we were a little disturbed about it. We uh, looked at it and concluded that what was needed was to, to do, do more training in how to write a project plan and what to do. And I remember in, in developing one of the videos that we used, one of the things we kept saying to people was, your project needs to have a thread that carries it through the entire project. You introduce that thread at the beginning, and you carry it through the entire project to the end so the reviewer understands it. But we didn't know what that thread was. Uh, I didn't have anything, and when I met Randy, uh, and start listening to narrative, what we realized is that the thread that we were talking about that we couldn't quite identify was narrative structure, and it was the need to build it in narrative structure. And sure enough, when we started talking about doing better and, and, and improving and developing a thread, we saw the success in review go up, and it plateaued. And then about the time it plateaued, we started training in narrative structure throughout the agency, and in the last few years, you can see as that has started to spread through the agency, that, that that plateau has turned into another upward curve. And as I retired from USDA, uh, the 72% doing well in review, instead of going down, had gone up to uh, 88 to, uh, to 90% doing well in review. So we really have seen a lot of benefit from that uh, in terms of, of, of the success of review. I would say also uh, touching on something that Heidi touched on in communications, uh, that one of the, the, the tremendous benefits to this uh, for people that I've seen from people in communications is that when they talk to a scientist, uh, they, get the, they get the whole story in great detail, but it's hard sometimes to, to, to dig through that and find out what is, what is the nugget that's really important that's gonna, that, that really is significant, why you're doing this, what's the impact of this. And the scientist uh, often is difficult, it's difficult to do that, uh, to, for them to articulate that. Heidi can probably agree that there have been times when she's talked seemingly for, for a, an hour or more with someone trying to dig through all of the data to find out what is the nugget that, that that's really important. Where's the, the piece in this story that, that I can hang everything on? And 
what this does is it gets scientists to understand it in that term and understand what what is the important thing to be able to express it, if not to the general public, which is really great, but also to a to a communicator who can then take that and shape it even further. But it makes uh, that's a piece I think of what makes Heidi's job uh, easier in terms of saving time because she can she can talk to people who know about it and know how to do it, and so they've already thought through. What is the narrative, the the ABT narrative of my research? Um, can you say a few words about the social dynamic? Um, tell that little tidbit about the one year you did the survey and asked people how many people had read their proposal before they submitted it. Yeah, yeah. This this was this was um, this is the other benefit of it, and and uh, I made a note here about it. That one of the, the benefits of of this whole thing is it gets people to start talking together and. When we did that, that, that study to find out how people were doing, one of the things we did is we did a survey, and we asked in the agency, uh, what, how, many, uh, how many of you, uh, you researchers who are doing this, um, have shown your, your re- research plan to, uh, to someone before submitting it to our office for review? Uh, we expected that a lot of them would would only have a few. We found that twenty five full twenty five percent of our researchers said no one read their plan before they, they before they submitted it for review. So essentially, we were getting un, unread first drafts coming in, and not surprisingly, our failure rate was somewhere around twenty five percent. What this training does is it overcomes that that reluctance and that barrier to getting other people to read and criticize your work. Uh, I, I think, talked about uh, people getting angry with each other at the beginning and having to get over that, but that's a really important thing because by the end of it, people no longer see this as I wrote this and it's perfect and you can't criticize it as much as I wrote this and now I want you to help me make it even better. And it's if, if the training I've said to, to my superiors when I was working with USDA, if this training does nothing but get our scientists to talk to one another and, and to work with one another and to, to craft their, their stories and to craft their research, it's done something huge. Um, and let me add to that. Um, some, we're learning as we go along with this whole training program. So, you know, it's not just set in stone. And we're finding that it, it does better with some organizations and groups than others. And one of the somewhat troubling things we've run into is seeing that students have a hard time with it. And one of the problems of that is an awful lot of students nowadays are really trained to be very positive with each other. And so we've ended up listening in on some of their discussions, and they don't seem to be able to critique each other's work well. They will write a really poorly constructed ABT, and the whole group will just compliment and say, oh, that's really a wonderful effort. And that's part of maturation, and it's an essential part of being able to shape these things. Because when you can get to the point where you can really share this stuff, and the bottom line is you cannot shape good narrative in a vacuum. You can't sit by yourself and really come up with these things because this is all communication. This is all human dynamics. This is not elemental and particle stuff the way you get in research science. It's, it's very different, that dynamic. So it's got to have this interaction with other people. Um, Michael, going back to you, can you say a few things? Do you, you feel like this is changing? You know, one of the goals of it is to eventually – Establish as sort of a norm, people just not feeling comfortable sending off a proposal without pulling together a group of people like this to discuss the narrative. Are you you've getting any sense of that? Well, you clearly already are with having the ongoing meetings with your group, but anything else you have to say on that? Uh, that, that would be the main point that I would echo, but just to add to the, the social aspect, I, I guess I wasn't clear when I first said, but the people in my group are from a wide range of specialties within the Park Service, so geologists, biologists, water specialists, et cetera. Uh, And I think it's just valuable, like we would not necessarily ever talk to each other about work or maybe collaborate on a project here or there, but it's just um, always useful to get outside of your own little bubble and see how, uh, especially for something like this, the narrative aspects can apply to all of those and they're all unified under that. Like it doesn't matter what the work you're doing is. If it isn't communicated strongly, no one's going to hear it, no one's going to appreciate it or understand it. Um, And that's a very good point about getting outside your bubble because this is one of the things we've learned is in the beginning, 
our initial instinct was if we're going to run this with geologists, we're going to give them all abstracts from their geological journals. And if we do it with botanists, we're going to go into their journals. And then we began to realize what happens is if you give a geologist an and, and, and abstract is really poorly written, really boring, but it's right in their field and they know it, they'll actually see a lot of interesting stuff in there and it will bias how they rate it. Um, and it's to the point now where we work a lot with Genentech and with them, these heavy duty molecular biologists, we end up giving them ecology and whatever parasitology types of abstracts that are totally out of their world. And it's really important to, to give people alien material like that so that they're actually looking past the content and spotting the structure there, the, the form. That's what the, the goal of the exercise is. Um, so, okay, on that note, we're at about quarter after. Um, let's open it up for questions, or we can keep talking if nobody has any questions. But does anybody want to ask a question right now? Just go ahead and speak up and unmute your phone. We'll try and sort through. Um, will Mike and Heidi be available for consultation by people at other government agencies who might be in this? Their agency know how to do all the paperwork and such? Uh, that's a great question. And especially Mike, um, Mike Strauss, he's been a superstar in coaching other agency folks in getting this going and tiptoeing through all the, the bureaucracy. Uh, Mike, you want to take it up? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to, to do it, uh, the qualification being that, that I'm not working for USDA at this point, but I'm happy to tell you about our experience and what we've done. But, um, yeah, it, um, there's lots of ways you can do it in the agency. We, we, did, what, uh, we did this uh, trying to let it spread organically through the agency. We started initially going to the top and sort of saying, okay, we'll get a big, big grant internally and, and, and go – top down and, and spread this out instantly, um, you get a lot of resistance higher up because it's, you're asking uh, your higher ups to take a, a huge chance on something that, that's unproven. Uh, instead, we started spreading it with a small group and then enlarging that group. And before, uh, before long, I was getting called by different areas around the country and being asked to come give a talk on, on it and what we were doing and, and uh, and we were able to sort of spread it organically around rather than, than a top-down approach. And sometimes I find uh, with government agencies that that works better. People like things that they know uh, have reasonable confidence are, are going to be successful. Um, they're a little more hesitant to commit large amounts of funding uh, until they know that. So this we allowed it, the, the, the training to sort of prove itself and then spread organically. And, and to that very point, um just to sing his praises a little bit further, Mike just did a brilliant job the last four years in innovating and basically knowing how to navigate the waters to make this stuff work and to go to the right people who would understand it, which is always a challenge. And um, he was with the Agricultural Research Services, ARS, within USDA. And it's kind of funny because I talk to a lot of people and I say that we, we kind of incubated this with USDA, and they're kind of baffled, like, that doesn't sound like a very innovative organization, and yet within ARS, they are very, very good, and then Mike's skill beyond that. So he's got a lot of practical knowledge to share in terms of how to get something like this going. Um, another question from anybody? Hi, I was wondering, um, do you find it best that the people in the circle are all in the same area uh, in terms of in-person um, meetings as opposed to distributed folks? Uh, great, Yeah, great question. First off, and we forgot to mention that all the way along, which is that um, early on we, we did the first four prototypes with USDA. Then Mike set up two in Fort Pierce, Florida, and one of them we called it local. All five people met in the same conference room for all ten sessions. The other was five people throughout the southeast uh, U.S., and they did remote, and they met through teleconferencing. And by the end of that, we, Mike in particular was in on every session, and he just really felt like there was no difference between. This is all so vocal that that was the start of us doing these remotely, and so that's become a fundamental part of the process is it works. It seems to work just as well whether everybody's um, remote or present. And it even works great just over the phone for the most part. I think it's, it's helpful and valuable, uh, ideally, for everybody to meet each other at a demo day in the beginning, have a little in-person contact. But then once it gets going, uh, Mike, you want to say more on that? 
Yeah, I, the the remote session at Fort Pierce, and we've done several since then. Uh, uh, we had, did one in the West that had somebody from uh, Hawaii, a couple people from Utah, and some people from Southern California. So it was uh, quite quite spread out. Um, initially, our thoughts were that we would need to get uh, a, a web and phone connection so people could see each other. Um, and as things worked with the Fort Pierce group, uh, we were just never able to get everybody connected by, by yet their their audio their video connected. Uh, some people's video didn't work; it didn't work as well. And in one case, uh, the whole uh, internet side went down, and all we had was telephone. And about halfway through, we realized it really didn't matter uh, as long as they had an audio connection. Uh, in a phone connection, that's all they really needed. Uh, I think it's it's important for them to all sort of met each other and know each other at the the demo day, but they don't have to have any tremendous knowledge. They just want to sort of meet and and greet and talk talk together uh, briefly at a demo day. And if they have that common uh, background, then uh, just a phone connection with five people works fine. And we've we've sort of dropped trying to put the the video into it. Just as a follow-up question, um, do you find it better that the folks that are in the circle are from diverse backgrounds that maybe don't do similar things, or does it also help if um, they're folks from different areas that are working on similar projects? Um, I, I, I would I would say, and I think Randy would agree that that again, he as he said in the beginning, we thought great they should all be similar and and have similar backgrounds, uh, I would say at this point, I would purposely mix them up if I had several and put them in diverse backgrounds because it underscores the need to communicate something to someone who doesn't know your field. And That's absolutely true. We, we see that all the time. And you get two people that work on the same problem, and they bypass so much narrative structure. I mean, that that is the luxury of talking to your own peers, your exact clone mates, is you don't need narrative structure if you could talk to your clone mate. You really can just be pure informational, but that's not almost anybody else in the world, and so that's why you need this. Um, another dimension of the whole training is that um, there's there's no homework, basically, so it's not like you have readings and anything to do outside the class. Um, the one thing you do is every five sessions will be your session where you send your narrative one to two paragraphs to everybody in the group, and that's what will get worked on within the group. And intentionally, you're not meant to do much work on that narrative. It's just write down two quick paragraphs. And in the in the session, in the second half hour, everybody will use the narrative tools to work with you to try and start shaping the narrative. But the interesting thing that happens is there's no out there's no outside homework like that, and yet everybody reports thinking about this the stuff on and on and on. The ABT gets stuck in your head. You start spotting it everywhere in the landscape. And that's what's kind of cool. And, I mean, Heidi, is that not the case, that people start thinking ABT night and day? Oh, totally. When you're watching movies or TV or anything. Yeah, reading a book. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I, exactly. I jokingly and Mike yeah. tell you about how much he annoys his wife nowadays breaking down the narrative structure of movies, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I joke. I tell people when they at demo days when I'm there that, that the one thing this is going to do is it's going to ruin their ability to just sit and watch a movie. Because if it's bad, they're going to want to sit there and figure out what's wrong with the narrative structure and why it's bad. And uh, uh, actually, my wife no longer gets irritated because she's heard it enough that she's she understands this structure. So now now we've we've gotten to the point of discussing the narrative structure of the movie as we as we leave it. But <laughs> but there's a lot of movies that we don't like as a result. <laughs> uh, another question, anybody? Have you ever had any participants who? did not feel that this was a success, who were disappointed or who felt that it was not a good use of their time? Yeah, good, good question. Let's start that with uh, Michael Bart. Uh, Michael, because I, I asked you that last week. Yeah, and I, I, would, uh, I would say no, not in my groups, although I did. I, I think the closest was the, the participant who felt at first that it was a total waste of time. And by the end, I don't think she was confused totally convinced, but it was she who suggested that we continue meeting. So I think uh, she was feeling the beginnings of narrative intuition developing and wanted to continue that. Um, so I would say 
full success um, for everybody at, at different, you know, different measurements, perhaps. But I don't think anyone left it feeling that it had been a waste of time. And and that was you. Yeah. You interacted with some of the people from all at, at um, National Park Service there in Colorado. They had six circles for a total of thirty-two people, I think. And you said that you bumped into many of them um, over the course of the year and talked to them about it, right? Yeah, absolutely, yep. Yeah. Um, and Heidi, same thing? Same thing. Yeah, we all ended up, like, actually really liking each other. And, <laughs> yeah, I don't think any of us um, thought it was a waste of time. We did what during it, the process of uh, the first three sessions, um, but afterwards, no, not at all. And Mike, you've been involved with somewhere around 13, 14, 15 circles at USDA. Have, have you had anybody bitterly quit the whole thing? Well, nobody's quit, but anybody felt disappointed by the end? No, I, I, I can't recall anybody really feeling disappointed. I will say that there's something very interesting that we ran into in the first, and we've seen it repeat over and over, is that, that people at the end, at, at that first uh, prototype, uh, Randy – I talked to everybody at the end and said, okay, what do you think about this, uh, you know, with the expectation that they would say, this is really great, um, I'm, I'm going to use this all the time, it's really transformed my writing. They didn't. What most of them said was, this is really interesting, I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to keep doing this. There was, there was some hesitancy about what, what it was really going to do. But over the next six months to a year, they all came back by six months to a year later and said, this is tremendous. It's really changed things. So they, the, the 10 weeks doesn't make you an expert in narrative. It gives it, but it does internalize narrative structure enough that you, despite any, sometimes your best efforts, you can't help but start applying it and using it. And they, they wind up year you know, over the next year, really seeing the value of it. And I think that that plan that did so well in review, um, she was one of the people who at the end said, yeah, I understand this. I think it's really good. I'm not sure if it's going to apply. And then she went back and started applying it. And the more she started applying it, the, the more powerful she saw it become. And we've seen that repeat over and over again. Uh, and now she is running the program there at USDA, right? right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Now she's running our program. So. Right. Okay. And that's that's a perfect note. We're going to wrap it up here. I'm, I'm just going to say one more minute's worth of comments. Um, but that's a perfect note to hit on at the end here, which is the thing. One thing we've run up against um, is people wanting to know where's your metrics, where's your proof that this suddenly turns people into great communicators, and the answer to that is very complex or, or nuanced because. What we're dealing with here is intuition, and intuition is not easily quantified. Read Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink. It's all about that. that this, is, this is, in a lot of ways, kind of the cutting edge of artificial intelligence. You know, They can put together all these templates and programs and things to create intelligence of a sort, but how do you jump it up to that higher level of really synthesizing these deeper thoughts? And this is what Michael talked about at the beginning. He told me about last week that I found so fascinating was that they actually saw that jumping off point where they switched from – going through the abstracts with a checklist of looking for the words and, but, therefore, to beginning to intuitively feel, wait, those three words aren't even in this paragraph, and yet it's perfectly structured. They've used other words or whatever. That's when you begin to get the intuitive feel. And that's essential for being able to communicate because just as another little analogy, um, for example, playing chess, you can go to websites and they can teach you the first five to ten moves in a game of chess. But they can't teach you much beyond that because there comes a point eventually in a chess game where you, the template is no longer any good. You've got to have the intuition to actually understand what the opponent's doing and what moves you can make. And that's the same thing that goes on with story circles. And that's part of the problem that we ran into with, with graduate students and undergraduates where they never got beyond thinking this is just about three words and but therefore. Um, in that AAAS video, I talk about how the, t the ABT template, it's both – template and tool it's the workout um, device that helps you start to build this narrative intuition and that's the ultimate goal so that's why there is still at this point no simple metric that, other than the fact that we've run 40 circles and people get it and you, that's why i wanted to do this discussion right now so that you could qualitatively hear these comments on on how it works and i think that's all the time that we've got for this today so kevin thank you very much maybe let us know where this audio will be posted um and that will wrap it up Absolutely. Thank you very much, Randy, Mike, Michael, Heidi. Thank you very much.